All right, ladies and gentlemen. So the first thing that we need to talk about today are your questions to ponder. So the first question to ponder is, what was the agenda slash purpose for the first Continental Congress? Well, at that first Continental Congress, they were drawing up their rights as uh, citizens and colonists, uh, as well as drawing up petitions to send off to the king asking for those rights to be respected. Um, they're also going to be discussing the successes and, boy, uh, successes and failures of their boycotts. Uh, they're going to be debating the proposition of independence, though many are still going to want to retain their ties of loyalty to England. Uh, and most of all, they are actually beginning their military preparations. Uh, so building off that, your second question is, who were the Minutemen? Uh, so your Minutemen are going to be your soldiers who are ready to go at a minute's notice, hence the name Minute Men. Now, these are going to be some of your uh, strongest, most ambitious military members. Uh, they're often going to be some of your youngest as well. Uh, most of them are under about 25 years old um, and are extremely gung-ho about the prospects of independence and revolution. Um, leading us to our next question, explain shot heard round the world. So the shot heard round the world is going to be the first shot fired at the Battle of Lexington in Concord. And it is heard round the world, um, obviously because at this point in time, England is the world's greatest power. Uh, and so one, one of its most profitable and successful colonial outposts is beginning uh, its revolution. Uh, this is kind of going to shake the world as a whole, uh, not only just shaking the relationship between England and America, uh, but also the balance of power within the entire world. Um, and then your third question is, what was the agenda slash purpose for the Second Continental Congress? Well, at that Second Continental Congress, uh, they were debating independence. Um, you're going to have the congressmen at this Continental Congress a little bit more evenly split down that line between those who would wish to retain their ties of loyalty with England and those who would like to go all out and fight for independence. Uh, more importantly, they're also appointing George Washington as the general of the Continental Army, and on top of that, they are sending off their Olive Branch Petition. That is their last and final plea to King George uh, to hopefully retain these ties of loyalty and stop uh, the military battles that are going to begin and have already occurred. Uh, but now for the rest of today, we need to talk about these independence-minded colonists and exactly where these ideas of independence are coming from. Uh, so, uh, public opinion is going to begin to shift drastically, uh, beginning from the 1760s all the way up until 1776. One of the things that shifts public opinion uh, incredibly drastically is that uh, bestseller by Thomas Paine called Common Sense. Uh, you can see an early 1790s printing of that book there on uh, your left side of the screen. Um, Common Sense is going to sell hundreds of thousands of copies in its first year and is going to be put out in January of 1776, predating that Declaration of Independence by only five months. Um, other thinkers that are going to shift public opinion uh, are going to be your great Enlightenment thinkers such as John Locke and his idea of a social construct. Um, others of these thinkers are going to include uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, as well as Baron de Montesquieu. Um, and you can see all three of their images there uh, at the bottom of the screen 
here. So, starting with Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau is from France, um, and he's the original author of the Social Contra Contract, written in 1762. Uh, the main beliefs or thoughts that are expressed in his uh, book, The Social Contract, are, number one, that all men are born equal and free. That every man is born equal and free of any ownership by other people or a government. Uh, the second main belief that is going to come out of the social contract is that government itself is a social contract among men. Right? It is something that people are agreeing to be a part of. Not that you are born with some sort of king over you and you have no control within your government, but rather that government is a social contract among men, meaning that society has agreed to be governed by whatever form of government uh, that country has. And that third belief that is coming out of the social contract is that no man can have absolute power over another, right? So no king can have absolute power over a kingdom. No person can own another person, right? All of these beliefs are tied up in that statement that no man can have absolute power over another. Now, our next Enlightenment thinker that we need to talk about is John Locke. Now, John Locke is from Great Britain, also known as England. Um, the two terms can be used very, very interchangeably. He is the author of two treatises on government, which is written in 1690. Now, you'll notice that that is about 80 to 85 years before our Declaration of independence is written. Um, and so his ideas are going to be bouncing around a lot throughout this Enlightenment period, right? People like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, um, as well as uh, Baron de Montesquieu, are going to be very influenced by John Locke's ideas. Uh, he also wrote Natural Rights of Men, and now we'll talk about natural rights. Uh, so it is his belief that all people have natural rights. Uh, specifically, what he thinks of as natural rights are your rights to life, that is to not be killed or murdered by anybody else and to have complete control over what you do with that life. Uh, also, one of his natural rights is liberty, right? That idea that you have freedom to do with your life what you will and the right to property that anything you own and are using in the correct way should not be taken away from you in any way, shape, or form, whether it's by government or the person next to you stealing it from you. Um, the next big belief that comes out of his works are that these rights are God-given and cannot be taken away by man. Right, So these rights are given to you by your creator um, in the Declaration of Independence. It's going to be said endowed uh, by your creator. Um, and so these rights are not given to you by men, nor can they be taken away by men. Um, they're also going to be known as unalienable rights. Um, so if we break that word down, unalienable Right? When we think of an alien, we think of somebody from outside of this planet, somebody who's different than us, somebody who's outside of the norm. And so if something is unalienable, right, you are unable to make it separate or different from uh, man as we know him. Um, and so he is also going to be somebody who is, uh, who is built off of Rousseau's social contract theory, that is that government is a social contract, not a written contract, but it's an agreement between society and government uh, to get along and operate as one. And our last Enlightenment thinker that we need to talk about is Baron Charles de Montesquieu. 
just like Jean-Jacques Rousseau. He is from France. Um, and the big thing that he is going to write is the spirit of laws. Um, and basically, the essence of the spirit of laws is about the division of government. He believes that government should be divided into three branches. That is the legislative, those who make laws or legislate, executive, those who execute the laws, right? You can see that word built in there. Uh, they're the ones who enforce the laws, execute the laws. And then the judicial branch, right? The one uh, full of judges who decides exactly how these laws can be applied and exactly if these laws are legal or not. Uh, um, and so built within this idea of having three branches of government is a system of checks and balances, right? The balances uh, or the each branch has a check on the power of the other branch, right? So if you're thinking about American government today, uh, the executive branch has a check on the legislative branch because the president can veto any laws that the legislative branch puts forward. Uh, the judicial branch also has a check on the legislative branch in that they are able to call laws unconstitutional and therefore null and void. The legislative branch, on the other hand, has a check on the other two. Uh, for example, they are able to override the veto of the executive branch, uh, giving them a check on that veto power specifically of the executive branch. Um, and so built within this is a system of checks and balances, because the main belief that Montesquieu has is that if you give one person too much power, basically, they're either going to screw it up or abuse that power. Um, and so throughout European history, you can see this happening over and over again, uh, first with emperors in Rome, and then later on uh, with kings and queens of early modern Europe. Um, and so out of these ideas, the Declaration of Independence is born. Um, and so your writer of the Declaration of Independence is going to be Thomas Jefferson. Um, and Baron Charles de Montesquieu is going to have heavily influenced him, as well as James Madison, who is the framer, writer, uh, and therefore father of the Constitution of the United States. Um, and so you can see Baron Charles de Montesquieu's ideas appear in the Constitution of the United States. Um, and so what you're going to be doing for uh, the next part of class is a blackout challenge and a rewrite of the Declaration of Independence, where you're going to black out the words that you may not know um, in the first part of the Declaration of Independence and then rewrite that in more student-friendly language. Um, so that's what you'll be working on for the rest of class.